You're listening to the expository preaching ministry of Kootenai Community Church, located in Kootenai, Idaho. We pray that Christ is exalted and your spirit is blessed by the teaching of God's Word. For more information about Kootenai Church, please visit us online at kootenaichurch.org. As we begin this chapter, chapter 3, in verses 1 through 3, just the first three verses, Paul is giving uh, a mandate, command, if you would, to rejoice. And then immediately he gives us an admonition, a warning about the Judaizers. And so as we look at this, we see the concern of Paul for the saints at Philippi, and we recognize that there's always been false teachers since the church began, and we will always be dealing with false teachers as well as false teaching. And as one of the roles and functions of an overseer, that is to warn the body of Christ, about these false teachers, as well as the heretical teachings that they proclaim. So this is part of what Paul is doing here. As we look at this, um, we think about these Judaizers who were placing confidence in their flesh, that is, their outward works that they tried to perform in order to somehow gain uh, a self-righteousness before God, which no one can do. As we understand scripture, any works of the flesh is as filthy rags to God. Paul here is wanting to warn them. At the same time, if he wanted to put confidence in the flesh, he was able to do so because he was not only a Pharisee, but he was of the tribe of Benjamin, and he gives this litany of things which he had physically, and yet he counted all as naught. As we consider this, Paul recognized that the only righteous deeds that a person can do is that which is done in Christ. The good news of forgiveness, eternal life, and the very heart of the gospel is found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Acts records the spread of the gospel in the early church, in the first century church, and the spread of the gospel throughout the Roman world. As we consider the epistles, they exhort us to practical holiness and practicing the truths which God gives us. We have uh, this exhortation from Paul, and he wanted to honor his friends and at the same time warn of their enemies. Am I still on here? Can you still hear? The truth of the gospel has been given in the New Testament, but there's replete warnings throughout Scripture. In almost every epistle that we read, there's a warning of some kind that we are to take heed to. Uh, Jim will be covering some of these warnings as he goes through the book of Hebrews. As believers, we need to examine ourselves to see whether our faith is genuine. Paul gives that exhortation in 2 Corinthians. Matthew gives this warning in chapter 7, verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father will enter. He also gives us a warning in the parable of the sower. Now, I'd like to take just a couple of minutes to look at that parable. And let's turn to it in the book of Matthew. Hold your place in Philippians and turn back to Matthew chapter 13. 
the Lord was teaching, and he gave a parable. This particular parable, the parable of the sower, the disciples did not quite understand what the Lord was teaching. So this is one of the very few parables that our Lord explained clearly to his disciples. And beginning with uh, verse 18 in chapter 13 of Matthew, we read this. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches it away, what has been sown in their heart. This is the one whom seed was sown beside the road, the one of whom seed was sown on rocky places. This is the man who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet has no firm root in himself but is only temporary. And when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately he falls away. And the one on whom the seed was sown among the thorns, this is the man who hears the word and the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. And the one whom seed was sown on the good soil this is the man who hears the word, understands it, who indeed bears fruit and brings forth some a hundredfold, some 60, some 30. So Christ, as he opened up this parable and gave clear explanation so that these disciples would understand what that parable meant and how it applied, they understood that there was always going to be people who professed to know and love God, and yet he gives clear example of those who eventually turned away. There's all kinds of warnings, and another good example that we have is in the book of Acts. Now, I'm not going to go into any detail in this passage, but in chapter 8 of Acts, we have an example of, from Scripture of a man called Simon. And as we think of this, he's a great example of a false believer. He was practicing magic in the city, but the text says he believed Philip, who was preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ. Simon himself believed, but not unto salvation. James says this in chapter 2 of his epistle in verse 19. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. So we have this parallel in James, which is a good example of who this man was, Simon, in the book of Acts. It says this about Simon. After being baptized, he continued on with Philip. By all outward indications, Simon's conversion was real. He listened to the word, he heard the gospel, and he received it. They, that's how it's revealed in scripture. And yet this is what happened. He made a profession of faith publicly. He identified with Jesus. Simon later had another encounter with Peter and John in this passage. Peter and John went to Samaria after they had received the word of God and prayed that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Now we have to remember in Acts, the progressive work of God working in different ways is unique. It's not a doctrinal book. It's a, do a book of the work of God that he performed in the first century church. It's a more of a historical book, although we can understand the truths of that word. Simon later had another encounter with Peter and John that they may receive the Holy Spirit. Not a second work of salvation. When we receive the Holy Spirit, we receive the Holy Spirit as a work at salvation. Simon wanted to lay, them to lay hands on him, so he offered them money to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is the response of Peter. Peter said this, 
May your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. Your heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent of your wickedness, for I see you are poisoned by your bitterness and bound by your iniquity. Then Simon said, pray for me that none of these things will be upon me. Think about that. That wasn't a repentant prayer by Simon. He didn't want the repercussions of his sin or the consequences of his sin. So he wanted prayer so that none of those consequences would affect him. That was not a prayer of repentance. He didn't have a repentant heart and he was not a true believer. Uh, historians say also that Simon was one of the early teachers of the false teaching, uh, teachings of Gnosticism. So that's where Simon ended up, following a heretical doctrine, but an unbeliever. Despite clear teaching of Scripture, we may be deceived about our spiritual condition. Some people think they're heading to heaven when reality they're heading for the destiny of eternal hell. They have a false sense of security, but it's not based on truth. And that's what we have to base our security on, uh, the truth that is revealed in Scripture. As we just saw in that parable of the sower, that fruitless profession of faith means absolutely nothing. Genuine faith produces in us a transformation in a person's life or dead faith will not seem will be revealed in those who make a false profession as we look at this we have to examine what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13 5 test yourselves to see if you are in the faith examine yourselves or do you not recognize this about yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail the test. As we consider this, we recognize that there's nowhere in Scripture that points us back to a place of conversion or an experience to validate our salvation. Scripture never teaches that. We don't look back and say, well, I remember going up the walking up the aisle at an altar call, or I remember being baptized. Those are not the things that we base our salvation upon. Nor is it... Hello. Nor is it moral works. We, we must, all of us, know some people who are unbelievers and yet live moral lives by outward appearance. They may be kind and honest and genuine and seek to live high moral standards. And yet, what they do, they do to their own glory. This may be commendable and even impressive by earthly standards, but it means nothing to God unless they're true believers. In Matthew, once again, he gives a warning. You don't have to turn there. But in Matthew 23, he says this. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs, which on the outside appear beautiful, but inside they're full of dead men's bones and uncleanliness. So you, too, outwardly appear righteous to men, but inwardly, inwardly are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Some people conform to what they consider to be Christian standards, perhaps because of pressure, social pressure, or because of family pressures. Uh, they might appear to live a moral life and yet never be regenerated by God's Holy Spirit. The example of the rich young ruler shows living a moral life. That was again in Matthew 19. He claimed that he had kept all the law, and yet he asked Jesus, what must I do to obtain eternal life? 
This reveals that he didn't have eternal life and he also turned away and didn't follow Christ. Another deception and is mere knowledge of the gospel and having some evidence of salvation. But James 2 again says this, that even the demons believe the truth and they shudder. There are some liberal theologians that try to profess truth of scripture or perhaps criticize the gospel and yet they never have come to repentance and salvation. Religious activity alone never proves anything. It's not an evidence of salvation. Many are baptized that aren't truly regenerate, and I'm talking universally. Although these things are true for a believer, it's never by these outward acts of baptism or any kind of the ordinances that will bring forth regeneration. In Philippians 3, 1 through 3, Paul says he's going to expound on recognizing and distinguishing between genuine, genuine and false faith. He gives several qualities of a true believer. True believer rejoices in the Lord. They exercise discernment and they worship in spirit. And they glory in Christ. And they also do not put any confidence in the flesh. Let's read the text. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same thing again is no trouble to me. And it is a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs. Beware of the evil workers. Beware of the false circumcision. For we are the true circumcision who worship in spirit of God and the glory in Christ Jesus, and put no confidence in the flesh. We have this combination of Paul rejoicing and calling Christians to rejoice, and yet at the same time, he's imparting an admonition, a warning about these Judaizers. A parallel warning, of course, was given in Galatians, and they were doing the same thing there. These Judaizers were trying to teach that not only did you have to receive Christ, but you also had to be circumcised. It's no different than false teachers today. Some claim that baptism causes regeneration, and we term that false teaching baptismal regeneration. As we consider the essence of true believers it is something that Paul is encouraging him to do uh, is to rejoice in the Lord. Now, the word rejoice or joy is used 150 times in the New Testament. That's how many times Christians are exhorted to rejoice or express joy. And Paul here is expressing to these Philippian believers as he's in prison in Rome to be joyful. Now, let's consider this word joy. It's only in Christ that we can have joy. It's experienced only by believers. The world, they can experience happiness. Happiness is something which is dependent upon our circumstances. If we have a circumstance that is positive, then a person can be happy. But it's only temporal. It's only temporary. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit of all believers. The word that was used, the word joy in the noun form is chara, which simply means gladness. The word here that is used in this particular one is you, <clears throat> euphros, euph, euphrosoni, euphrosuni, excuse me, euphrosuni is the Greek. Pardon my lack of clarity there. This word refers to a gladness of heart based alone in Christ Jesus. That's the total antithesis 
of happiness, which is a temporal type of rejoicing or temporal feeling of exaltation. But joy is implanted in the believer. And yet Paul here is commanding them or urging them to rejoice. So even though that is a fruit of the Spirit, we don't always exhibit that. And that's part of Paul's exhortation here. He wants them to express that. It isn't the hyperactive person who is trying to put on this, feign this joyful attitude. It is a true internal trust in Christ. It's not based on extrinsic circumstance. We may say that circumstances are drawing me down or burdening me. We saw in chapter 2, Paul's burden. Remember the concern he had over Epaphroditus? Epaphroditus was sick. He was ill, almost to the point of death. And Paul said that the Lord had mercy so that he didn't suffer sorrow upon sorrow. Paul was rejoicing because of God showing mercy on Epaphroditus and healing him. Paul didn't do it. The Lord did. So one of the elements of being a Christian is our humanness. We may suffer sorrow and sadness, and that's apart from the understanding of what true joy is. That's an emotion which God gives us that we can feel for somebody who is suffering or we ourselves may be going through a sorrowful time and as we have suffered the loss of a loved one or a family member, we come to a place of sorrow. I read something recently that was rather illuminating to me. It was a survey taking, taken of several Christians, numerous Christians. They interviewed them and they wanted to know how frequently they read their Bibles. Only 20% out of those surveyed read their Bibles on a daily basis. When you think about it, that is a sad commentary. That means 80% of those that were interviewed, Christians that were, some of them were in Christian Bible schools, some of them were from active members of churches, all of them were professing Christians, but only 20% read their word daily. <clears throat> Yet we wonder why there's so many joyless Christians. The teaching of Paul here is to have Christian joy and express Christian joy. The world is full of troubles, sorrow, and yet rather than adopting the spiritual approach to face our troubles and sorrows, sometimes we adopt worldly methods. Now, the antithesis of that is there was this 19th century theologian that described those who uh, put on a sorrowful or somber countenance in order to seem more spiritual. And D. Martin Lloyd-Jones quotes this. He said these Christians that this theologian spoke of in the 19th century, scorned delights and lived lives of laborious days. They went about with somber countenances, trying to put on a false sense of spirituality, whereas the true Christian are only ones who can experience true joy. The most depressing people I have ever met, D. Martin Lloyd-Jones, are those who try to give the impression that they are always happy and cheerful. Those that are truly joyful don't need to tell everyone how happy and cheerful they are, end quote. That is an unfortunate uh, prediction, and yet it's an unfortunate circumstance among believers in having unbelievers who profess to be believers and go around spouting the joy and yet their lives can be full of worldliness. 
and never have true regeneration. The second mark of a Christian is one of discernment. Paul says, to write the same things again is no trouble to me. And it's a safeguard for you. Beware of the dogs, beware of the evil workers, beware of the false circumcision, for we are the true circumcision. Paul had just commanded the believers in Philippians to rejoice. But now he brings forth the warning against the enemies of the gospel. And as true believers, they should have discernment. And we should grow in discernment the more we mature as believers, the more we understand and study God's word. We should be able to discern truth from error. And the deciding factor and the, the means of discernment comes through God's word. So the more we grow, the more discerning we become of false teaching and false teachers. <clears throat> Pastors should be warning against false teachers. This is part of what we did during the Reformation series. We warned of the false heretical teachings of, of the church of Rome, the Catholic Church. We brought forth the teachings of the Reformation as opposed to the teachings of the Catholic Church and the heretical teachings that were being brought forth even from the third century forward. That was part of what we did in the Reformation. Paul here warns against these false teachers and teachings. And <clears throat> through ritual and ceremony and legalism, he wants to safeguard them literally. He, that means to not to trip or stumble. He wants them to be safeguarded against abandoning the truths of the gospel. Just as he did in Galatians. He warned him and said, well, why is it now that you are practicing in the flesh what you began in the spirit in Galatians 3? Here, he's warning him about the circumcision that have infiltrated Philippi and is encouraged circumcision, is encouraging circumcision. <clears throat> Previously, uh, Paul said this, and in verses 1, the first chapter, verses 27 and 28, he says, Let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ. So whether I come and see you or remain absent, I hear of the affairs that you stand fast in one spirit, with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel, and not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which to them is a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation, and that from God. In this passage, Paul told about the Philippians not being alarmed by their opponents. Here he tells them how to recognize them. He refers to them as adversaries, as dogs, as evil workers, and false circumcision. Paul seems to be referring to a previous ex exhortation that believers are to take a united stand against their adversaries. He calls these Jews dogs. Now, that's a term today, as we look in a contemporary society, we look at dogs as pets. Nice, comforting pets, pets that are always loyal to their masters. Dogs, in, during the New Testament period, took on a total different connotation than what we have realized dogs as pets now. They were diseased. They were savage. They were scavengers. If you were to be bit by a dog during the New Testament early church in the Middle East, it's most likely that you would be infected and some died. So this is what Paul was describing. These false teachers, he was likening to these savage, diseased dogs. The same effect. He was dis they were distorting and destroying the gospel, which became no gospel at all to these, circumc these Judaizers, trying to get them to perform 
works in the flesh rather than walking in the power of God in the spirit. So he calls them dogs, evil workers. <clears throat> Truth and love are mutually uh, exclusive, not exclusive, excuse me. In Ephesians, Paul says this, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. As Paul used these strong terms to define these Judaizers, some accuse Paul of being cruel and harsh and unloving. But exposing error is an act of love. If we can give truth and dispel error, that's a pure act of love. Paul was truly angry at these Judaizers. Look what they're doing. You have these younger believers in that midst who are being swayed by these pseudo-religious people, which were the Judaizers, and trying to perform acts in their own strength recognizing that they thought they were the righteous ones and yet had no righteousness at all. Our righteousness is in Christ. Paul recognized that and he hated the false teaching that they were bringing forth. He didn't hate them, even though he described them as dogs. He wanted them to see how savage they were, distorting and perverting the gospel. As we think of that today, we should be on guard for those whom we have opportunity as God gives us opportunity to disciple and teach. We should bring forth truth when we see any error. Help them understand from the word of God truth and expose error. <clears throat> Paul was once one of these people. He was persecuting Christians. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He did everything he could to try to destroy those in the first Christian church. Paul, at the end of his ministry, or towards portion of the end of his ministry, in Timothy, he says this. <clears throat> he considered himself as the chief of sinners in 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16. <clears throat> we have to understand, here's a man who has he matured. He understands the essence of sin and how wicked is, it is. And yet he recognized what he did as an unbeliever. He recognized as a Pharisee, he was attacking God's people and the body of Christ and that's why he considered himself chief of sinners. Yet he understood redemption and God's forgiveness. And yet he recognized what he did. He didn't carry guilt. He understood God's forgiveness, but he recognized the great damage that he pursued as a Pharisee before he was a Christian. Unlike the Judaizers, and false circumcisions, believers are the true circumcision. They have an inward spiritual cleansing. We're cleansed from the inside. We are not cleansed by some outward work that we attempt in our own strength. Paul understood this and he was bringing this truth to them. Third mark is they worship in the spirit. In verse 3. It is a heart that overflows with worship. It's supernatural since Paul understood this. The Holy Spirit prompts us to worship him. It isn't a place that we perform worship. It's not where we are. In fact, in John chapter 4, he says this. But an hour is coming. This is Christ speaking. Is coming and now is when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For such people, the Father seeks to be his worshipers. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. 
It isn't anything outwardly that we do. It's a work of the Spirit in us that causes us to want to worship and praise God. It's his work. Some try, and this Martin Lloyd-Jones says this, some try to motivate moods during a worship service by extrinsic means, outward means. That is, they may attempt to create a happy or joyful emotion or a response to a certain kind of praise or hymn. Or perhaps there is an attempt to sway the emotions by trying to promote an atmosphere of a festive nature with an upbeat tempo of music. So rather than allowing or leading songs that are based on sound theology, they focus more on the orchestration. It's an extrinsic rather than intrinsic motivation. He ends his quote by saying, we are familiar with the various methods that people will persist in employing to this end. For instance, in a public meeting or a public act of worship, think how often something like this happens. The leader of the meeting says, well now, let us first get to the congregation in a good mood. Let's put on a hymn or tunes or chorus of a certain type. We must get them in a happy mood. We must get them to rejoice. These are attempts to produce joy by doing things to our emotions and our life which are calculated to lead to that result, end quote. So even during this period when D. Martin Lloyd-Jones was preaching and teaching, mid-20th century, he recognized this error of trying to promote something outwardly to cause an inward feeling of joy. And he condemned it. The fourth characteristic of a true believer is this. They glory in Christ Jesus. Paul is fond of the word glorying and boasting or exalting. He uses it 35 times in his epistle. Glory is used here to describe the believer's joyful exaltation. As true believers, we give all the credit for who we are and what we have to Christ Jesus. And a good example of that is Paul to teaching in 1 Corinthians. By the grace of God, I am what I am. 1 Corinthians 15, 10. Let him who boasts, boast in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1, 31. While unbelievers boast according to the flesh, 2 Corinthians 11:18. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. We studied those solas in our study of the Reformation, and yet we sometimes forget where our righteousness comes from. And yet our righteousness is in Christ, and he wants to produce in us good works which he does by the empowerment of God's Holy Spirit. <clears throat> we glory in the cross and his atoning work. Paul said this to the Galatians, but far be it from me to glory except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world was crucified to me and I to the world. Galatians 6.14 one of the last characteristics, which in this outline, we don't take any confidence in the flesh. Paul says, put no confidence in the flesh. The flesh here is the represent, representation of our fallen, unredeemed humanness, and which includes this heredity, heretical ceremony and legal moral advantage. That was another quote by MacArthur. It says, do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Romans 8, 4 says this, and those who are of the flesh cannot please God. So anything we try to do in our own strength, which is easy to try, is worthless. And yet Paul is urging them to good works. He's urging them to be warned and discerning of these false teachers 
and he's warning them to be alert to what they're saying. As we conclude this text, we may never come to a fullness on this side of glory of all of what God's word reveals throughout the scriptures. And yet, God gives us understanding of his word as we study God's word and as we allow him to open our hearts to the understanding that even though God is finite and God is infinite and we are finite, we have the ability by God's grace to examine his word, to apply his word, and to honor his word and bring glory to him. Even though we live in this world of sin and sorrow, it's not dependent upon the circumstances to have joy in our hearts. Is that is a work of God's Holy Spirit, and that is a work that God does in us. So Paul understood this, and how <clears throat> Christ alone provides, regardless of our circumstances, that we may experience this joy. We're not dependent upon our circumstances. We're dependent upon our relationship with Christ. And the only way we can truly understand and keep renewing that understanding is to be in God's word regularly. To know God's word and to practice God's word and to proclaim his word to others. I, my prayer today is that we'll be able to understand this. There is sorrow over loss of a family member. The Kinney's, John lost his father this week. And we mourn with the family and we want to lift up that family as we uh, recognize that uh, it's always in God's time. Our lives are in his hands and we can trust in God's sovereignty. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. And Father, we do pray that we'd be able to rejoice as a result of the work in us through your Holy Spirit of regeneration and that we might be discerning of false teachers and that we might be able to recognize and dispel any false teaching and to do so for on behalf of others. We just give you thanks today and come together to praise you, worship you, and to celebrate your word. And we ask, Father, that you would be glorified as we do so, and that we might be edified and be able to participate in the celebration that you have provided through your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for listening to the latest podcast from Kootenai Church. If you'd like to learn more about Kootenai Church or to donate to our church ministry, you can do so online by visiting KootenyChurch.org. We hope you enjoyed this podcast and pray you'll join us again next time. Once again, thank you for listening.